listening to them and uh, join them. And I guess um, so the, the purpose of this discussion would be to talk about exploration, maybe broaden the conversation a little bit from maybe specific topics, maybe to more general ones. And I guess I was just noting some some themes that were coming up throughout the talks that um, we've had. Um, so one of those themes I think is how do we evaluate progress? So Ian was talking about um, B-suite. Um, Will mentioned kind of some of the, the pitfalls of overfitting to RL. Um, Chelsea is talking about maybe, you know, moving from the object level RL to metal level RL exploration there and how that maybe, maybe there's some less um, or different kinds of mythologies with respect to overfitting and fooling ourselves in progress. So I think that's kind of like a really interesting topic, something I'm interested in and I hope we can talk about. Um, there's also um, a theme that I'm really interested in as well that, that about meta learning exploration versus de designing ourselves and which, which of those things we think um, is promising for, for different situations. Um, and uh, Will's talk, I think, uh, hit a little bit on, on the challenges of, of eventually when exploration to kind of work in this like hierarchical way where you know, you're ex exploring not only on just you know, taking actions, but on tip with, with options. And I think that's kind of a really important topic. So those are kind of just some of the, the really the broad things that I, that I noticed. Um, and maybe I, I guess what I'll do is just maybe I'll seed conversation here with, with one or two questions. But I, I guess as I do that, I want the speakers maybe to also be thinking of um, questions that they think should be asked. So uh, I also want speakers to, to kind of think of the big questions that we, we as a field of exploration should be thinking about. And feel, feel, feel free to kind of pop those onto the stack and we can kind of ask our, ourselves those things. Um, so maybe just to, to begin with, um, to see discussion, um, I think I just find myself drawn to this question of evaluating progress, um, because I, I think it can be kind of deep and also uh, confusing sometimes to think about. Um, so how, how should we think about progress and exploration in, in RL? Um, is it, um, you know, benchmarks of the way? So like, you know, like Ian working on, on B-suite, is that if we, if we solve those, those benchmarks problems, if we're, we're kind of codifying the, the things we think are the ingredients of progress. Is that the way we should go? Or, or is there something deeper there, like just about in, in, true insights and exploration, would they be revealed by benchmarks or some other way? So it's kind of a broad question, um, but I'm just happy to see where that goes. And any of the speakers can, can feel free to, um, to chime in on that. So one data point that I can give against benchmarks is that when we actually started the, the main paper that I presented where we were looking at exploration and meta RL, um, we looked at kind of the existing things that people had evaluated on in the meta reinforcement learning community, and none of them really challenge the exploration aspect of the problem. And when we then kind of took all the algorithms that were developed on those so-called benchmarks, because they weren't really introduced as benchmarks, they were just introduced as evaluation um, in various papers. Uh, when we evaluated them on a, on a problem that really challenged exploration, they really fell flat and they, they couldn't find a good exploration strategy. So um, I think that it's hard to have the foresight for what exactly, um, what exactly will, what are the challenges, what will challenge our algorithms and so forth. Um, in general, I'm, I'm generally a fan of benchmarks, but I think that they need to be really continuously evolving with the field based off of where our current algorithms are at, uh, so that we can continuously add kind of our, our latest knowledge and insights into what we know are the, the challenges for current methods. Yeah, I mean, I, okay, thank, I guess I'll, there's a bit of a tragedy of the comments here, so I'll, I'll, I'll jump in as well. I mean, I definitely think that, um, you know, it's, um, I guess one thing to remember is that the exploration, I guess at least the way that I think about it, and probably most people, um, is that it's not this like magically separate thing from the rest of RL. Um, you know, you can tell when you're doing good exploration, when you're doing good RL. Um, I guess the problem is, or it's not a problem, but I guess maybe the, the issue that a lot of us think about is that, you know, being fully, even being fully greedy and like dithering for exploration can do quite well in certain domains when paired with reward shaping, when when paired with whatever domain knowledge, when paired with whatever. So that it can be kind of hard to to say, oh look, you know, I guess that the expiration is one of these things, maybe it's one of the last things that we seem to be hand tuning, you know, in our agents. I know that's definitely true with Alpha Star. Um, you know, the one thing that they would always do by hand is the perturbations to find the new agents. And so um, you know, I think that 
for for me b suite i guess the important thing about that is to try and stake a claim of like okay if we can instantiate certain benchmarks that will exist in some way to represent some aspect of the um, exploration problem then these can be good representatives that can add like that can become part of the ecosystem so that people realize oh wait there's something here that needs to be solved um as opposed to just like oh well what do you mean i'll just you know add a shaping reward for that so I, I think that maybe it's something we need to discuss and what do we expect from our RL algorithms. I'd, uh, I'd like to add something, mainly that I, I, I really agree with a couple of different points that, that they've just made, that our benchmarks should be kind of evolving at, over time. And the, the, the thing that I would like to add to that, though, is that exploration, and this is towards what Ian was saying, but exploration is so tied to all of these other parts of RL, right? It's it's super tied to representation learning, to credit assignment. Like if I devise some amazing exploratory policy, but it's so far off policy that my on policy learning algorithm or, or, or policy gradient method can't really make use of that, then that's not a very useful exploration method. So exploration maybe more than almost anything else is so entwined in RL that it gets very hard to, to evaluate. I, I like the idea of having benchmarks that we are continually adding to and making sure that they're kind of, they kind of cover the, the space of problems that everyone cares about because it's really easy to focus on the problems that I care about or you, know, you focus on the problems you care about, but having sets of problems that we, we all think are important seems really useful. Um, I'll, I'll give my, uh, my viewpoint on this as well, which is, um, you know, uh, I think, uh, one way to also avoid, uh, falling into the overfitting trap for particular, um, particular, uh, ben benchmarks or particular domains is to, uh, is to, uh, is to make sure that we simultaneously advance the uh, the state of theoretical understanding of what we know about the methods we have, because I think if we can have algorithms that have both some kind of worst case guarantees as well as uh, do something sensible in problems that are easier than worst case, I think that can give us a lot more confidence about those methods than if we know only one or the other. If I can jump in here, Joel, as well, I feel like I, I, I have to say something about exploration benchmarks. Um, I think the, the benchmarks also have a really valuable role at, at moving the thinking forward in the community. And I am going to throw you to the lions just a little bit here. Um, I think Go Explore is an example of this. Did cause a lot of stir in the reinforcement learning community, but I think it was saying, well, here's a problem you think is a hard problem from an exploration perspective, and here's here's a solution which maybe you didn't even think was a solution, and this is also exciting in some sense, right? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's funny, I guess, yeah, being thrown at the lions. Um, yeah, I guess, uh, I think the thing um, about Go Explore that I think is interesting, and maybe other panelists would think this, this theme is interesting, is um, kind of questioning some of our assumptions, like the formalism itself. Um, like, you know, for example, um, there are some situations where you have a simulator, and you can just exploit that simulator um, in any, any way, and that's actually fine. Um, and so maybe that's that's one class of RL that we care about. And you know, the gloves are off there; we can do whatever we want. Of course, there's other situations where you you know want to um, play more by the the standard rules of RL. Um, but I think it's kind of like an interesting theme. I don't know exactly how it ties into exploration more broadly, but um, you know, questioning the reward function: where does the reward function come from, and how does that actually um, get codified? In some cases, it'll be wrong. The reward function could be wrong. There's some assumptions that we we baked in that just really aren't um, true. Um, so I mean, like riffing on that, I guess, are there other places where we should think about questioning the, the formalism of RL with respect to exploration? The ways we can cheat, ways that we can not cheat? Um, yeah, it's kind of another broad question. I'm curious what, what everyone would think about that. Thank you, if I may, uh, friends, um, yeah, this is, this is related to uh, Will's points earlier that uh, exploration is tightly coupled with other aspects of reinforcement learning. And, and I, I feel that in, in many cases, the difficulty in evaluating exploration is um, how to separate these exploration from other challenges. Because also why I think working on offline RL or policy RL is so much cleaner, easier. 
Um, and, and it raises a question um, that at the end of uh, Ian's talk, that um, when we um, talk about uh, different natures of the problem in exploration benchmark, how do we measure uh, generalization, for example, or, or, temp or the need for temporal credit assignment? How can we quantify these uh, dimensions and then use it to uh, to capture the difficulty of a problem and then to, to benchmark exploration. Um, this is something that I think would be interesting to, to think about. Along the lines of what Joel was um, was asking, I have a lot of thoughts on this from the perspective of the work that we do in robotics. So I think that with any benchmark, we really like, ideally we want it to reflect kind of real world problems that we care about. Uh, one example of that is robotics, but there are, of course, a wide number of other examples where reinforcement learning could be applicable. Um, but specifically in the context of robotics, there's lots of assumptions in which uh, reinforcement learning is either a bit too strong or a bit too weak, uh, in my opinion. So, um, like, access to a reward function can be actually quite challenging in robotics because you can just observe what your sensors are giving you. You often can't observe more than that, and it's hard to define a reward function on top of that. Um, sometimes you can get demonstrations that make the reinforcement learning problem considerably easier, or examples of states that are good and bad, and that may also make the exploration problem considerably easier. And in practice, we very rarely run reinforcement learning from scratch uh, without any sort of demonstrations or, or any kind of starting point from there. Uh, and then beyond that, uh, in this isn't really built into the reinforcement learning formalism per se, but we often assume that we can just kind of reset the environment and have this really episodic setting uh, where we can just keep on trying and again and again and again. And in robotics, that's, it requires a human to be there constantly for the entire process and almost defeats the point of reinforcement learning itself if a human has to be a part of that process. Um, so there are, I think, are all sorts of assumptions that uh, uh, that we should be reconsidering when we make benchmarks and trying to try to develop benchmarks that are reflective of robotics kinds of problems, but also other real world problems. Yeah, I, I guess um, I, I think to I think reminding going back to what Leon asked, I, I think you know benchmarks are great, and if we can you know if we can distill, you know, I think that B-suite, you know, I guess I presented about that. That's one type of benchmark that I think hasn't got so much attention, which are these like simple diagnostic, you know, they're almost like um, didactic. They're there to teach you something by this like example. But ultimately, that's like a much weaker form of understanding. Like nobody teaches linear regression by example on like, oh, this nice data set, right? I mean, maybe you do, like, I, you've seen that plot where they have the, like, oh, this curvy one, that curvy one, this up and down to show you, like, how things can go wrong. But, you know, I think if we if we got to a stage where you, I, I'd like to aim for a deeper form of understanding than that. And, and you know, especially if, you know, I guess what I'm maybe I'm looking for, you know, I think we all agree that um, we know that Epsilon greedy or whatever, that that's not good, or Boltzmann exploration is not good enough, right? We know it's not good enough from theory and we know it's not good enough from examples. And so let's let's develop the tools or examples or experiments or maybe theory that will help us get something that works a lot better. And, and that means algorithms that work better in terms of data and information gathering. Anyone else wanna chime in on this or I can... Um redirect. All right. Um, we have to farm for dissent. We have to farm for conflict on this. I think we are all too <laughs> reasonable. All right, all right. I, I, could, I, could, I could actively farm for dissent, I suppose. Right. Um, I, so here's like, I don't know, an interesting question that I, I struggle with thinking about sometimes. I'm really curious about um, the panelists. I, I imagine I, I kind of maybe understand some sort of your position already. But um, you know, there's a question as we think about maybe scaling RL algorithms to, to really, really, really ambitious things, you know. Um, so robotics policies that can do like just about could learn to do everything a human could do or, or something like that. Um, and there's a question about like what we should what should we hand design in exploration and what should we what should we learn? So, you know, Chelsea has been talking about meta learning. A lot of other people have been talking about kind of, you know, hand coding um, exploration strategies. And I guess sometimes I don't know how to think about um, 
yeah, which is the more promising approach, or maybe neither is, and they're both good for different situations. But maybe there's some dissent there we could kind of uh, illuminate. Um, should we do we should we invest more in meta learning? Should we invest more in object level learning? What do you guys think? I mean, as Chelsea said, like you still got to be able to solve a single task in order to do meta learning, right? So you can't completely ignore uh, understanding exploration in a single MDP and designing better exploration algorithms there. Uh, I think, you know, we 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 can't completely forego that. Uh, but I think I do think that yeah, like there there are uh, interesting. Uh, uh, I mean, definitely, the more we can learn, the better. I think the uh, you know the the thing that maybe we have to also become uh, better at is a lot of the exploration algorithms that we currently design often they're 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 designed with like particular worst case uh, scenarios or particular kind of problem structures in mind and they tend to be overly wedded to that those structures and this was some of this was also coming out in for instance will's presentation and just having um, approaches that for instance when they see something that really is amenable to epsilon greedy because there is such rich signal coming in the problem every time step well, you better not have just as poor behavior as you would ha have in like Ian's deep sea or something, right? And having that uh, ability to adapt quickly, I think is um, is still largely missing from a lot of approaches. I think if we had those, uh, we could we might actually feel much better about the state of exploration um, in our. Uh, yeah, I guess I'll I'll say I agree with with Alec on that. You know, I think you know. Uh, and I guess it, it links to a, an answer I gave to Mar Martha's question, but maybe someone else should also try and answer that. Deep sea is definitely something, I think it's an example that's informed by some intuition from the tabular setting. And I think that the tabular setting is basically where by far the lion's share of exploration research has been done. But I, I guess, you know, Alec, you know, you, you definitely, you know, a lot of people in this group are are pushing towards but, but just because we have that, and just because I, you know, I'm someone pushing, hey, let's have this tabular one in as a sanity check, I think that we shouldn't lose track of, of the, the focus, which has to be exploration with generalization. And so generalization, you know, okay, there are different words, but you can say generalization. You can also talk about exploration with prior knowledge. You know, the interesting point of exploration is not the first action in your tabular rasa. Right, you 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 open up Atari game and you take your first action. No no algorithm can do anything good on the first action, right? That's not interesting. So the interesting is like you've played it for a while, you know some stuff. There's some other stuff you still don't know. There's generalization, which is uh, you know similar to having prior knowledge, which is similar to having the meta RL setting. So I think that's the interesting, you know, that's what we have to aim for and what we need to focus on. I, I super agree with what Ian just said and and want to just say like this this kind of gap between completely separate tasks where meta RL is is typically applied and just applying the same type of uh, method of, of reusing experience and generalizing to new problems in how you explore seems like the the way to go that there is no like clear task boundary that we're con we would like our algorithms to be constantly kind of meta learning the, the type of things to consider from an exploratory standpoint, even if it's in a single uh, lifetime. Yes, yeah, so one thing in general, I agree with everything that's been said. I will say that I think that um, Will said that, that maybe there's no task boundary. And I think that in general, I, I think that's reasonable, but I also think that um, it allows us, making that assumption allows us to get more traction on the problem. And there are situations where we can build tasks and, and build task boundaries, and that may allow us to do considerably better on the problem than if we assume than we were if we were in kind of the most general setting. Uh, and given how hard the reinforcement learning problem is, I'm all for kind of making whatever assumptions we think are reasonable in various problem domains to to make things more tractable and and, and more practical. Um, that said, I agree that like in meta RL, like it's defining the tasks is a burden. Uh, in some ways, you're kind of taking the burden on, like from like, I don't know, reward design or something like that and moving it towards the burden of uh, designing these task distributions. Uh, and 
So hopefully we can also move away from defining the task distributions at some point and, and place it in an even easier place to uh, to specify. Like maybe we just have to write down a bunch of sentences that correspond to the task that we want our thing to do. And that would be like, that would be great. Then it just like derives task from that or something. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I think that we should be constantly rethinking the problem setting that we're in, whether and, and the assumptions that we can introduce to make things easier, at least from the standpoint of, of making progress on, on real world problems. Uh, I'm going to try to stir up more uh, controversy. We'll see if it works. But so my, my question is, is exploration in deep reinforcement learning sort of inherently stuck until we understand uncertainty in neural networks? Like, is this just, is there not much we can do until we crack that problem? I think it depends on how you define the exploration problem in reinforcement learning. If your goal is to define- In, in deep reinforcement learning. In, in deep reinforcement learning, yeah. yeah. But even then, like there's, there's, if your goal is to define, to define a single strategy and an algorithm for exploration that works across a wide range of problem domains, it may be possible that that just doesn't exist. Uh, that it may be impossible to, to kind of define an algorithm that works as well as we'd like it to on all the problem domains that we care about. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I, I think the only hope, sorry, I, I had a food delivery, so I didn't mute it. But um, um, I think the only hope is that you have to say you're designing e uh, exploration algorithms for the exploration algorithm ideally is going to take in some, you're going to say, I want to make something that's good for, and any RL algorithm, it's good for a certain family of environments, right? And then the exploration and whatever should be tailored towards this. And, you know, I think meta RL makes this very explicit, or I guess like it's almost like workmanlike and like what's the distribution? What's the distribution you've seen? And you should learn from that. Like that's very concrete. But even if you, you know, it's basically the same thing as like the Bayesian prior, or you don't even need to be Bayesian. You just have to say, hey, which environments do I care about and which ones do I not? And probably if you say, hey, I don't care about deep sea or whatever, well, you can hope to do better. And and this has to be what we're aiming for, like of the right exploration. It's like you give me the family and I give you good exploration for that family. Yeah, so I mean, I, I, I think, you know, in, in, in some ways, uh, like, it, so it, it's sort of certainly a valid one way implication, you could say, right, that if I had an amazing way of characterizing um, uncertainty in um, neural networks, um, you know, that should certainly be useful for exploration and reinforcement learning. Uh, I do think that once we start making structural assumptions about the underlying reinforcement learning problem, we might be, it's, it's uh, plausibly, uh, what we need for exploration can be easier than uh, a generic uncertainty quantification. Right, so uh, a, a pretty, um, again, um, interesting example of uh, this that at least I've seen in some theoretical work, uh, work um, uh, is um, so if you have these um, like block MDP style models, which is basically that there is an underlying uh, Markovian tabular state, but you instead observe a, um, a higher dimensional emission process from it, uh, then yes, you can uh, kind of do um, explore. Then you can build things using neural networks still, uh, where you use the neural networks uh, to basically perform like two sample tests uh, by noise contrastive estimation. Uh, but but what what comes out of that is a is a valid um, kind of uncertainty quantification for the purpose of exploration at least. Uh, so while it's not a completely generic uncertainty characterization, it, it sort of works, it's a, it's a valid one within that model. And, and I think uh, that's a sort of uh, pattern we're probably gonna uh, see repeating uh, over and over again, more generally um, in, in reinforcement learning problems, or we should, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of, again, like, you know, this point's been made a few times before, but uh, we really should not hesitate in leveraging problem structure as long as the structure is coming from uh, representatives of real uh, applications. We just should should be careful not to overfit to like the structure present in Atari or Mojoko. I like Alex's answer and actually want to take it further and say, 
since, uh, since we need to be controversial here, I think actually trying to characterize uncertainty in neural networks is actually probably what is keeping us stuck. Uh, I think there's a lot of environments where you get exploration for free and maybe as we scale up our, our techniques, I mean, exploration will remain a problem, but it might be easier in the places where right now we're looking. Um, a good analogy here is maybe backgammon, right? If you're famously backgammon was, uh, was a domain where we could make progress as our, uh, you know, NRL, because it mixes very well, right? Uh, I suppose riding a bicycle, I don't know if that's a good example or not, but certainly you, you quickly learn if you fail at doing the thing correctly, what happens. Um, I, I would guess, you know, there's all kinds of things that we are uncertain about in the real world that we somehow are okay not exploring. And whether it's a structural assumption or simply that there's another drive that causes us to behave differently. Uh, I'd love to explore some of these ideas uh, myself personally. And I guess, yeah, I agree. That's a good point, Mark. And I want to point out something, you know, having mentioned deep sea or these pathological or whatever, you know, okay, well, I definitely noticed the similarity between maybe, you know, oh, you need to worry about this type of efficient deep exploration and the same type of people maybe who were in the 90s were like, hey, you can never optimize a neural network by gradient descent because it's non-convex and blah, 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 blah. Okay. Um, so, may, you know, it's possible. I actually don't think, I'm not quite ready to, to, to give it, but I'm, I think there are parallels there and you should be worried about that. I think if you work on exploration and you're worried about like all these things, you should be worried that, hey, is this something that actually matters in real problems? Maybe just being greedy and a bit of dithering is okay. And you don't need to do uncertainty quantification. I think that, you know, I think, I think the, the great success of uncertainty quantification in DeepRL has not come yet. So that should make us worried. Ian, do you think that's due to a, some, you know, potential limitation of uncertainty quantification? Or is it maybe that, like Daniel was saying, like, we just haven't cracked that particular problem well enough? I think it's more like that. You know, I think actually people give all these memes like, oh, deep learning has been around since the 80s. They had it all figured out. But it turns out, well, okay, look, there's obviously more to it than this. But it, I think if you have to say it, ReLUs instead of sigmoids, quite important. Um, Atom instead of SGD or like different momentum things, quite important. And mostly if you had this big sigmoid network and you did SGD with constant step size, it basically doesn't work. And so, and now everyone's like, oh, it worked the whole time. It didn't really work, man. But yeah, the main ideas were basically there. And I'm hoping that it's something like that. that that's kind of what I'm hoping, is that we need the sort of ReLU or the Atom that kind of unlocks the, the epistemic uncertainty. And because we know it can be important in, in simple things. And I guess in my bones, I feel like it's even more important in important things. But I will admit the evidence is not there. So you should be suspicious, I think. So we are kind of hitting the the official time. I do have allowance to go up to 15 minutes over. So I, I am tempted to use that because I really enjoy this discussion, but I don't, uh, maybe what I'll say is, is for um, for panelists, that can, sorry, for speakers that can stick around, please do stick around. For audience who wants to stick around, please stick around. And I think there's also kind of a link floating around now to the, um, yeah, the gather, uh, if you want to kind of jump to the social. Um, but, um, Maybe I, I kind of want to open it up to kind of questions that we should be asking that we're not. So maybe like for the speakers or anyone who has this sort of idea, like what are sort of the, some of the big things that we should be talking about, maybe that are underappreciated, uh, that are issues within um, exploration and, and, and deep RL. Um, I need to go to a TA meeting soon, but I'll, I'll very quickly jump in on this and say that uh, I, I feel like I'd love to see more work on thinking about exploration when you have a little bit more than just a reward function, when you have examples of good states, when you have demonstrations, something along those lines. I think there's been a little bit of work on this, but it's really not the kind of mainstream reinforcement learning research. And it, it is a situation where it's pretty practical in, in a pretty large number of domains. Um, I was going to add, not necessarily related to what Chelsea just said, but, um, you know, I think there's a, a real 
issue with, I, I like benchmarks by the way, but uh, there's a real issue with benchmarks become like benchmarks mac maximization becoming kind of the, you know, measurement of progress. And um, one of the ways that this can be done is by varying, you know, your other parts of your, your training paradigm in ways that like, maybe don't make things exactly comparable. You know, I can, I can adjust my neural network. I can adjust how I'm training and all these ways that aren't necessarily doing a real even comparison. And, and part of the, the, the excuse for that is because it is really hard to, to do a really apples to apples comparison if my setup is slightly different than your setup. Um, but I think this is really problematic because we can go down all sorts of kind of blind alleys or, or, or make mistakes about what we think is actually happening. I don't have a solution because I do think benchmarks are really useful, but I think this is, this is something to worry about as well. Yeah, when you say that, Will, um, is, it, is it speaking to the challenge of reviewing and that, um, that oftentimes reviewers will use just benchmarks as sort of like a first heuristic, whether something's worth looking at and I guess like just that there's pressure then to hack that heuristic or is it, um, is it also something deeper about just the challenge of understanding whether something is insightful or not on a deeper level? Um, yeah, I, I think more on the, the second side. I, I don't think I can I can blame reviewers here at all. I mean, I think we are the, the, the people doing it. Um, but like a, a really easy example, which is like something I can call out on my own work is like comparing, you know, if, if I do something with a huge number of environmental frames and compare against something with very few, there's just no reasonable way of talking about what's going on between these two algorithms. Um, and benchmark uh, maximization really kind of encourages that in many other ways of kind of getting your, your, your method to look, look solid or, or even deluding yourself into thinking that it's solid. That, I think that problem though is, um, you know, I think that I completely agree, Will, but I think that that problem, you know, let's just, I want to highlight another benefit of like what B-suite is, but the benchmark, you know, we can have the benchmark, which is do X in a certain amount of frames, right? And that can be the focus. But, I, you know, I think that there is, there's an uneasy tension in RL in general about like, oh, well, well what are we really trying to do? Like, are we, are we doing Atari because we want to get a really good Atari player, right? AlphaGo is the big success of RL. But the truth is what they really wanted was a really good policy for playing Go, right? Nothing else mattered, okay? And then the same is kind of true of a lot of the DQN or whatever. That's the focus. I go, I want a really good policy that comes out at the end. And then there's, I think the expiration stuff really, you know, if it was to be successful, it's all about, hey, I want an algorithm that's going to be ongoing in the world and it's going to learn really well and all these things, blah, 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 blah. And I don't like set off, I don't like turn epsilon to zero for, you know, this final game or something like that, right? Um, because I'm doing these games because they're a make-believe for this unknown future where like RL will rise to the fore and it will do all this AI stuff for me. Right. But it, it's not, um, even within DeepMind, you know, I think we have this tension, you know, is the AI the policy or is it the RL algorithm? I mean, that's a, that's a nice segue to the other thing I wanted to point out is when we are, uh, you know, of course, like both in, both in theory and uh, these domains, when we study exploration, uh, because we, still by and large uh, kind of um, ignore this complexity that well really the spirit of exploration as the agent is going to be just like uh, be out there and be interacting with its real environment and uh, suffering the consequences uh, we don't really see that much uh, work at the intersection of um, exploration with other concerns like safety and robustness and um, you know maintaining sort of a a viable performance uh, level so that you know somebody doesn't pull the plug on your algorithm uh, in a in a real system and how do you in some sense uh, make reinforce make exploration interoperate with all those complexities i think is i mean it's really hard but it's uh, really important if we want to get these rl agents to be tried out in uh, important domains 
Yeah, I think I have uh, resonated with uh, you know well like the comments that uh, from Will, Ian, and Attic is uh, I mean perhaps in a slightly different form is for for off policy RL that we discussed yesterday. I think the sort of you know the real world applications are a little bit more clear. Whenever you have a lot of like offline data, historical data, and you want to do better decision making, sequential decision making, this is kind of like the application like target for uh, you know offline RL. Whereas for online exploration, uh, I think the situation is less clear. And I think that partly has led to the confusion we currently have is like, uh, is because, you know, you, when you say, I'm gonna do exploration, like in an environment, like before you you talk to the people in that, for that domain, you kind of like don't know like what kind of exploration you're allowed to do. Like Alex said, like safety constraints and all of that. And, you know, it's, uh, it's a bit unclear and also uh, as well, I think it's well said, you know, what kind of additional feedback uh, and pro probably Chelsea, uh, additional feedback and signals do you have to to make your exploration potentially like much, much uh, easier. Uh, so maybe we need to, I don't know, just work on that direction a little more to, uh, to guide us in terms of like what are more important in exploration. I mean, in some sense, uh, that's partly why I've also found it interesting to think more about reward-free exploration lately, where uh, you really are kind of uh, being forced to ask yourself, what are the other uh, signals beyond just the explicit reward that you should or could leverage? Um, and I do think that, I mean, most of that still ends up being largely pretty homogenous in terms of, okay, maybe I'll just like try to uh, do some prediction problem about my future, uh, but sort of the more, certainly the more heterogeneous um, data sources we can leverage, better it is. All right, well, maybe I will um, close out this session. I, I really appreciate Alec, Ian, Will, uh, Chelsea, and Adsentia um, for, for this really interesting discussion. It was, it was a pleasure and um, yeah, I think the social is, is going on right now and I uh, hope to see some of you there. Thanks, Joel. Thanks, Thanks. Joel. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, Thank awesome. You Thank you. Yeah. See everyone on uh, tomorrow. I really love all the talks and discussion. And a uh, big thank you to all the speakers for the fabulous talks and Joel for moderating the inspiring discussions. Uh, come join us tomorrow uh, when we talk about optimization and RL and deep RL. Thanks. Thanks for joining us right now, the social as well. Thanks. Thank you.